An old poem tells of a woman who was walking through a meadow one day. As she strolled along meditating on nature, she came upon a field of golden pumpkins. In the corner of the field stood a majestic huge oak tree. The woman sat under the oak tree and began musing about the strange twist in nature, why tiny acorns grow on huge branches and huge pumpkins on tiny vines. She thought, God blundered with creation. He should have put the small acorns on the tiny vines and the large pumpkins on the huge branches. Before long, the woman dozed off and in the warmth of the late autumn sunshine, she was awakened when a tiny acorn bounced off of her nose. Chuckling to herself, she amended her previous thinking. Maybe God was right after all. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, founded by George Vanderman sharing messages of hope around the world. Today, Henry Fire Robin presents The Mighty Creator. Some people would like to serve God in an advisory capacity. I'm thankful that he doesn't need our advice. His creative works show wisdom and forethought that no human being could duplicate. Looking at the days of creation, we discern his intelligence and insight. He created the trees that stretch toward the skies, and then he created the birds. What would have happened had he created the birds before the trees? How uncomfortable they would have felt during their first night of existence, because they need a tree to relax as they nestle among the leaves. Because a thoughtful God did not want to cause distress to a bird, he made the trees and bushes first, with their fruit and their berries and their leafy bowers. There's a lesson in this for us. Jesus says that we are of much more value than many sparrows. God made the blossoms before he made the bees. He made the grass before he made the cows, each successive day providing for the next day's needs. He created light and air, water and soil, grass and plants, shrubs and trees, fish and insects, birds and animals before he created the human race. With deep love, he anticipated our needs. He brought cosmos out of chaos, light out of darkness, habitation out of desolation, and life in his image. What is the name of the God who did all of this for us? The first time God is mentioned in the Bible, he is referred to as Elohim. We find it in the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God, or Elohim, created the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1.1. Elohim is identified as the creator, the word is derived from the roots El, meaning mighty, and Ola, to make an oath or covenant, or to swear or promise. The word El itself is translated God some 250 times, and frequently in circumstances which especially indicate the great power of God. In Numbers 23, 22, God is spoken of as the El who brought Israel up out of Egypt. In Deuteronomy 10, 7, we read that Jehovah, your Elohim, is God of gods and the Lord of lords, the El who is mighty and dreadful. The word El is used in that great name, Almighty God, the name under which God made wonderful and mighty promises to Abraham and Jacob, Genesis 17, 1 and 35, 11. It's also one of the names given to the promised Son and Messiah of Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, the mighty God. By this name, God is presented as the mighty covenant maker who lives up to every promise he makes. The word Elohim is used 2,555 times in the Bible. It's used 27 times in the 31 verses of the first chapter of Genesis. It is interesting to note that the word Elohim is plural, indicated by its termination, ing, the Hebrew ending for all masculine nouns in the plural. There are those who, in an attempt to get around the obvious reference to the Trinity, claim that the plural is only a plural of majesties, such as used by rulers and kings. Well, there's no such thing as a plural of majesty in Bible writings. No king of Israel ever spoke of himself as we or us. But to add further proof that this was not a plural of majesty, when referring to the Almighty God, the singular pronoun is used with Elohim, 
Were it a plural of majesty, it would read, we are your Elohim, but instead it reads, I am your Elohim. According to the grammatical rules of the Hebrew language, the subject and verb should agree in number. Dr. Leslie Harding suggests, by means of this grammatical abnormality, the inspired finger points out the nature of deity. The King James Version of the Bible says, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. The original Hebrew text uses the plural saying, Remember now thy Creators in the days of thy youth. Isaiah 54, 5 refers to thy makers, plural, is, is thy husband. Singular verbs and adjectives used with the plural name Elohim in the story of creation as well as the story of, of salvation suggest that the Trinity acts in concert and that the qualities possessed by each are identical. The use of the plural implies that the word in the singular is not full enough to set forth all that is intended. In Genesis 1.26, Elohim says, Let us make man in our image. And in Genesis 3.22, Behold, the man has become as one of us. At the time of the construction of the Tower of Babel, Elohim says, Let us go down and confound their languages, Genesis 11.7. In Genesis 35.7, Jacob builds an altar at Bethel because there the Elohim, plural, is revealed to him. Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? It's obvious that the Trinity participated in the creation of the world. The Holy Spirit is introduced in the second verse of the Bible in connection with creation. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, Genesis 1-2. There are those who would insist that the Holy Spirit is a New Testament novelty. Not so. We turn to the writings of Peter. And in 2 Peter 1.21, we find these words. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. What part did Christ play in the creation of the world? Speaking of the Son, John said, All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, John 1, 3 and 4. Paul says in the first chapter of Colossians, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Further evidence that Jesus was the creator is found in the book of Revelation. Jesus is the Lamb that is receiving honor and praise on two counts. He's worthy of praise because He is the Creator. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Revelation 4.11 But He's also worthy because He is the Redeemer. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for Thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Revelation 5, 9. The name Elohim expresses the general idea of greatness and glory. It contains the idea of creative and governing power, of omnipotence and sovereignty. It is Elohim who by his mighty power creates the vast universe, who says and it is done, who brings into being what was not, by whose word the worlds were framed so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. Hebrews 11.3 He's the covenant maker. To make a covenant implies the power and right to do so, establishing the fact of absolute authority. A covenant is a contract or an agreement. The Bible describes God's gracious approach to humanity. To use modern terms, He comes to us and says, let's make a deal. He invites us to the bargaining table even though we have absolutely nothing to offer. He brings everything, we bring nothing. This is not an agreement between equals, each with their own interests and demands. 
When Elohim enters into a covenant with humanity, He lays down the stipulations. Salvation and covenant blessings come on His terms, never on ours. We don't bargain with Him, but we do make a choice. We can refuse the divine offer or we can gladly accept committing ourselves to the divine stipulations, thus qualifying ourselves to receive the rich benefits of divine promises. Elohim, the mighty God, all-powerful, is willing to bind himself by an oath to puny men and women. All of the benefits come from him. The preliminary covenant was made with Adam and Eve at the time of the fall. We find it in Genesis 3.15. Adam and Eve had nothing to offer. They faced the penalty of death. When everything looked so gloomy and hopeless that they fled from the presence of God, when the guilty pair, bowed down in despair, found themselves in a totally helpless condition, God came to them with the promise of a Savior who would bear their penalty and provide them with everlasting life. They had absolutely nothing to offer in return. Their only alternatives were to accept or to reject God's gracious offer. Later, God made a covenant with Noah. There was nothing in Noah to warrant his worthiness to make a bargain with his maker. He had just come out of the ark after witnessing the destruction of civilization as he knew it. We can imagine that the first cloud which swept across the sky would alarm him with the fear of another flood. The first drop of rain would be a frightening omen of disaster. But out of pure favor, Elohim came down and entered into bonds with him, never again to destroy the earth by a flood. He sealed his promise with the sign of the rainbow. A rainbow is a magnificent portrait of God. The appearance of the breathtaking loveliness of the rainbow transports our human vision above the earthly landscape, giving us a preview of heaven itself. Imagine Noah's family, eight weary refugees cast upon the ravaged slopes of Mount Ararat, looking up into the clouds. <laughs> the sun broke through, a rainbow appeared, and with it the promise that never again would God judge the world by a flood. The book of Revelation closes Scripture with a rainbow encircling God's throne. It is one more reminder of His promises and a comfort to us as weary pilgrims waiting here at the end of time. In the book of Isaiah, God used the story of Noah as a symbol of His promise to us. We read in Isaiah 54, Verses 9 and 18, this, the words of Isaiah. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. Then the great Elohim is seen making a covenant with Abraham. This time there's no rainbow. What is used to ratify the covenant? The book of Hebrews says in Hebrews 6.13, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, Hebrews 6.13. The purpose of an oath is to provide confirmation of what has been stated. Men call upon God to witness their integrity. Since there is none higher than God, he swears by himself. <laughs> and in thus committing himself, God, for man's sake, follows a custom familiar to men to convince them of the dependability of his promises. With regard to Israel, over and over again it is written, I shall be unto you for Elohim, and ye shall be unto me for a people. To Israel in distress come the words, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your Elohim. Isaiah 41. In the book of Jeremiah, we have the prophecy of a new covenant. 
an everlasting one, which God will make with his people when he will write his law within their hearts. We find it in the book of Jeremiah 31 and verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. Although there are two distinct covenants, there is in them an essential unity and continuity. The same ultimate end is contemplated in both. The second has been introduced because the first became ineffectual. It was given as a provisional anticipation. It was what the book of Hebrews calls a figure for the time then present, Hebrews 9.9. 9. The earthly tabernacle with its sacrifices was only a shadow of things to come. And we read in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 1, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. The real difference between the old and new covenants is not a difference of moral behavior. The same Ten Commandment law is the standard of righteousness. Under the old covenant, the law is written on tables of stone. Under the new, it's written on the heart, Hebrews 8.10. Paul makes allusion to this when he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. How strong is your faith today? Can you totally count on God's promises? As we face the 21st century, we can't afford to be almost a Christian. We can't afford to be 99% certain of what we believe. It's not sufficient. There may be situations where 99% is a high enough average, but there are many situations where it simply isn't enough. If only 99% of airplanes reached their destiny safely, we would have 18 major plane crashes every day around the world. If only 99% of doctors were certain that they were operating on the right patient, doctors would operate on the wrong patient 500 times every week. If only 99% of our mail reached its destination, 17,000 pieces of mail would be lost every hour. When God makes an oath, it's no less than 100% accurate. A man once went to his attorney and made this request. He said, I'm going into a business deal with a man I don't trust. I want you to frame an airtight contract that he can't break and which will protect me from any sort of mischief he may have on his mind. <laughs> the attorney replied, Frankly, there's no group of words in the English language that can take the place of plain honesty between men. There's nothing that can be put into a contract that will fully protect either of you if one of you plans to deceive the other. Your name is tied to your character. If your character is bad, so will be your name. You are wise to establish a reputation for having a good name or reputation for being honest trustworthy and steadfast, because your name will not only follow you in all the days of your life, but all the days of your children's lives as well. The book of Ecclesiastes says, a good name is better than precious ointment, Ecclesiastes 7.1. Though there seems to be no contract among human beings that can't be violated, the opposite is true of divinity. We read in the book of Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verses 16 to 19, for men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil." Do you believe the hope that is the anchor of your soul? Is the ship of your life being tossed back and forth in the storms of this life? Let Elohim be your constant source of encouragement. 
The same promise made to Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, and his descendants, and to the Christian church can be claimed by each one of us individually. The document is official. Elohim has sworn an oath. Read about it in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 6. He says, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am Elohim, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. In Philippians 2, 9 to 11, Paul applies this text to Jesus, our Savior. We can look to him and be saved. I invite you now to take your eyes off of the things of this old world and look to Jesus. You can count on him. He's the mighty God, the mighty covenant maker. During the darkest hours of World War II in England, a gloom swept over the nation as Hitler's Luftwaffe dropped tons of death and destruction upon London. There was a legitimate fear felt for the safety of King George VI and his family. His staff, therefore, made secret arrangements to transport the king and his family to safety in Canada for the duration of the war. Despite the urgings of his advisors, George refused to leave his countrymen in their dark hour. Shortly thereafter, an incident was reported in a London newspaper in which the king was inspecting a bombed-out section of London after an air raid. While walking through the rubble and entanglement, an elderly man walked up to George and said, You, here in the midst of this, you are indeed a good king. That is what Jesus says to us, that God is with us in the ugly part of our lives as well as the good, that he does not desert us in the darkest hour of our despair. He is there in the midst of the rubble of our broken dreams and the ruin of our tangled lives.
Let us pray. Dear Father, mighty Creator, we thank you that we never have to walk alone. Bless everyone hearing my voice with that assurance, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Isabel's song, I'll Never Walk Alone, expresses a marvelous truth for every one of us. Through a study of the names of God, we not only learn more about Him, we can actually learn to know Him personally. In the very first chapter of the Bible, He is presented as Elohim, the mighty creator and the covenant maker. In the scriptures, He is known by more than a hundred names and titles. A study of seven of these names will bring you to a deeper knowledge of the mystery of godliness. Henry Fire Robin's book, Seven Names of God, will be a valuable tool in your study of the nature of deity. We want you to have a copy of this book as a gift from the It Is Written telecast. Ask for the book by name, Seven Names of God. It will be yours without cost or obligation. Call our toll-free number now or write to us at our Oshawa office. Here is the information you need. As a convenience, you may request today's free gift offer by calling our toll-free number at 1-800-253-3000. Call right now, 1-800-253-3000. Remember your gift is sent free and postpaid. You may have to dial the number more than once, but please keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number, and the name of the gift you're requesting. Call toll-free from anywhere in North America, 1-800-253-3000. Lines are open 24 hours daily. Or, if you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to It Is Written, Box 2010, Oshawa, Ontario, L1H7V4. And thank you for your letters, your prayer requests, and your generous financial support. Write, It Is Written, Box 2010, Oshawa, Ontario, L1H7V4. How quickly our time has slipped by. And now if we say goodbye for another week. Be with us again next week at this same time. And until then, remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God.